what we bought, or Alan bought, was the f original French play called Le Cage aux Folles, written by Jean Poiret, a Frenchman. That play was bought by Marcello Denon and made into the movie that we all know, the French-Italian movie, Le Cage aux Folles. When we bought the rights, we went right to the source, the original French play. We didn't buy the rights in the movie because it's the play, the French play, that you could create the musical for. So we had those rights, but we had no rights in the movie. So what you have to understand is we had to write the musical with anything that was in the French play, but we couldn't take anything new that was in the film because we didn't have those new elements. It was his kind of show. I think he saw flamboyance in it as he was in life, as a human being. Um, but I think he also saw the entertainment value. For all, you know, the, the, oh, the party personality that he is perceived to have been, and some people think nothing more, Alan was no fool. He was very smart, and he wanted to make entertainment and thought that this could make money. What we were told in rehearsals of the actual definition of la cage au folle and how to pronounce it uh, is la cage au folle, but it actually translates into the cage of insane ones or fools or crazies. Uh, but folle actually was a derogatory word for gays uh, in France. And so it's a colloquial term that they would understand uh, for the movie they just, uh, for America, they just called it the birds of a feather. It has nothing to do with birds. But that's where they get the bird cage comes from that. The most important thing a producer does is who's going to compose it, who's going to write it, uh, the book, and who's going to do the lyrics, and who's going to direct it. And the first group that we went to was superstars beyond, at that time, beyond anything. Mike Nichols directing, Maury Yeston who actually was the kid of the group, had just done Nine, the musical Nine, to do the music. Jay Preston Allen, who was one of the biggest screenwriters in Hollywood, to do the book. Tommy Toon, to do the choreography. You couldn't think of a, a, a more extraordinary group of writers. <clears throat> they were represented by the most important uh, entertainment agent in New York City, Sam Cohn. And what proceeded was a nightmare of negotiation where every one of these stars wanted more money than the other person. And it got going higher and higher and higher until I finally called Alan and said, look, you do what you want. You're the client. I'm just the lawyer. But my opinion is that you've created a monster. You will ne you'll, you'll have a show. You will never, never make any money. You can't. It's, it's just completely out of control. Alan for whatever however, whatever happened, whether he just trusted me or not, or whatever, he got on a plane, he was in my office the next day, he walked in and I said, so what do you want to do? He, I assumed he was going to go over with Sam Cohn and figure out how we'd close these deals. He said, make an appointment with Sam, we're going over there, we're firing all of them. We went over to see Sam. Sam was sure, surely going to, uh, surely thought that, um, surely thought that uh, we were making a deal. And we walked in, and we sat down, and Alan said, I love your clients, they're great, I think you're terrific too, but I'm moving on, and I'm hiring a completely new team. Sam Cohn, who uh, had the um, habit of um, eating uh, tissue paper, uh, uh, Kleenex and paper, spit out the paper he was uh, at that moment, could not believe it, stood up and said, you're joking, you can't possibly tell me you're walking away from the most important group of talented people in the entertainment business. Alan said, I am, and that's my final decision. He shook his hand and left. From the very beginning, Jerry Herman, who of course wrote Hello Dolly and Mame, always wanted to do La Caja Fall. But Alan went to Maury because Mike Nichols wanted to try Maury, whatever, so he didn't give him the rights. The next phone call he made was to Jerry Herman. Jerry Herman went through the roof. One of the biggest decisions, of course, was going to be the the, the locomotive director to run this thing. One of the people that came up was Arthur Lawrence. Uh, Alan, I don't know how, but he knew Arthur. Scary Herman certainly knew Arthur Lawrence. And, uh, and Alan was thrilled because, you know, Arthur Lawrence, uh, going back to West Side Story, was one of the, the icons of musical theater. 
And then the question was, who was going to write the book? Now, Arthur Lawrence is a book writer of his own right. Arthur Lawrence had written uh, West Side Story. Okay, so this is not in, in many famous movies. But Arthur was very smart about this. He didn't think he could write this as well as someone else, and that was Harvey Firestein, because Harvey Firestein had just written Torch Song Trilogy, which was about a, a gay man and his apartment and his, his life. And because Le Cage Fall, on the basis of was, you know, a story of two gay men, Arthur thought that Harvey probably had a great sensibility, a young sensibility for the show, because Harvey was a very young man. And Harvey turned out to write a brilliant book with the supervision of Arthur and Arthur's direction. Here you have Jerry Herman and Arthur Lawrence, of two people who combined probably have more experience in the musical theater than anybody else if you had them together. I mean, you can't tell them what to do. But the first thing that really was done was the score was filled out. And there was a, 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 a reading audition of the score and, and Jerry Herman's spectacular brownstone in New York, where he lived at the time. And the score was overwhelmingly good. I, I, I've never seen anything like it. They had the theater owners there and Jimmy Nylander who ultimately booked it. And there wasn't one bit of criticism. People were over the moon with the score. George came in and auditioned, just like anybody else would come in and audition. And he came in in full drag. And it, it was an upright piano on stage. And he got up and sat on the top of the piano and sang. And when he was done, Arthur turned to us and said, we've, I think we've got our man. It was that simple. I remember a great bit of business. They, uh, he had to pick up the phone to call Shay Jacqueline. He goes, you, you, you pick, up, pick up the receiver, dial the number, and speak sweetly. And then you go, hello? And they go, OK, George, um, take off your earring. Women take off their earring before they, they he goes, oh, OK, hello? <laughs> he pulled off this one. So he had like no feminine sense at all. But it, we kept that bit of business. And of course, I do it when I do the show. I don't think it was as much a concern for George. Um, I think for Gene, it was more of a problem. And um, I think he was worried and concerned. He had a certain image that he had, you know, had in the television industry. He was, he was a major star. And George worked well with Gene, but he wasn't that great a, a, a fan of Gene. He felt that, that Gene was always holding back a little bit, always holding back a little bit. And maybe he was. You know, he was concerned about who he had been as an actor for all these years and decades, a tel major television star and all of that. And he didn't know how he was going to be received. Gene, looking back, was a little intimidated by George because of George's theatrical background. Now, Gene had always been on the stage. He started, started life as a chorus boy, a Broadway chorus boy, a singer. Um, but George had quite, you know, a resume behind him. And I think that intimidated Gene a little bit. And when Gene felt intimidated, he could sometimes be a little defensive. And um, George is the antithesis of that. He is this all-embracing artist. Uh, everybody loves him who's ever worked with him. And there was no kiss at the end of that show. Since then, George and, I mean, uh, George and Alban always kiss. And I think it's kind of important uh, that they do, that you see that, that you see it's a viable, loving, romantic, physical relationship. But mm, no, it was never going to happen with those original two. They put an ad in Variety that said, Alan Carr is looking for a new young star to play the role of the son in La Cache Fall. And I was like, I am going for that. And I didn't get it. <laughs> I got a Cajel instead, but still I got the show. I did my full audition, and before I left, he came around the back of the table and whispered into my ear, and then told the, uh, and gave me instructions, and then told the uh, pianist to play A Pretty Girl Is Like a Melody. And then he went back down. And so uh, they started playing, and I did what I was told, which was I started dancing around and undressing and taking things off. And got down, got kind of everything off, but the very last little bit, and I started pulling that down, and Barry and Fritz goes, ho, ho, stop, stop, thank you, that's enough. And uh, I just, that was the end of my audition, but I did get a call back. And so they cast us on the spot, and 
Arthur Lawrence comes to the front of the stage and called me forward and he said, I know that we were seeing you for Jean-Michel, but uh, we want to use you in the line, in the drag line and make you a feature. So they gave me a little, nice little feature spot and I was Hannah from Hamburg, the whip-wielding dominatrix. Uh, there were four of us that were featured in, in the line of 12 Cajels. All of us were named David by chance. Um, and we each had a little feature moment in the opening, but I had a really very nice little full minute whip dance with two Panthers in the, in the big Lacage number. So it was very featured. And then again in the finale. So it was a very nice little plum spot for my Broadway debut. Real Panthers? Drag Panthers. There were 12 Cajels, 10 guys, two girls, and they were hidden in there. And it didn't s specifically say so in the program, but the audiences knew. I mean, they didn't, but if you looked at the names, you could tell there was a Deborah and a Linda in there, but you didn't know which one it was. And in fact, there was one that was so feminine looking, you were sure it was the girl and one girl who was kind of masculine looking. You, you see, so you couldn't tell. And at the end of the number, we'd pull wigs off, but two of them would shake out and their hair would fall. But it, one was a girl and one wasn't. And so it would throw you off. And it was, it was just, it was only in that original production did it happen. The, the two revivals since then, they don't, they don't hide girls in there. But it was just a fun little treat for the audience. It was the same year as Sunday in the Park with George and The Rink, the Candor and Ebb musical with Cheetah and Liza. And um, we weren't quite sure. That, that, you know, I mean, we certainly were, were not a shoe in because the New York Times and um, other people in the business, very powerful people in the business, were campaigning openly for Sunday in the Park with George. And <laughs> this is going to sound really pretentious, but we in the legitimate theater don't do that. You know, we don't take ads saying for your consideration. And, I, and I'm not saying that films and television is, is, you know, any less classy than we are, but le theater just doesn't do that. It's, it's just not part of our DNA. Um, and I, I think there might have been a bit of a backlash against Sunday in the Park because of that. It was shocking that, uh, and glorious, that Jerry won over Stephen Sondheim for score, but it was surprising. It was, it was a surprise to us, and I think most of the Broadway community. And I remember Jerry's speech that night, and he said that the, uh, the hummable tune is still alive and well on Broadway. And people took real great issue with that, um, that but I, 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 I understood his, the spirit of that. And I thought, yes, that, you know, that, that he meant the simple, simple tune, like the kind of music he writes it that, you know, yes, Sondheim is great music, but still his stuff can win. But it was a surprise to us. And then we also won Best Musical. I, we, we were shocked that night. Prior to rehearsals, I remember the words grid and arc, but the word AIDS, I hadn't heard yet. There was gay cancer before it, but it was really new. And New York and the theater community was hugely affected by it, and everyone was scared. The Broadway community was decimated. I would say at least half of the chorus on average of a uh, male chorus in every Broadway show uh, succumbed uh, to AIDS. and. We were going to uh, memorials just all the time, and it was just a horrible time. We lost two of the original Cajels, David Kahn and uh, John Dolph, in the first couple of years. Also, we lost uh, Bobby Brubach. We lost Teddy. Bobby Brubach was, uh, he played Francis. He was an understudy. Uh, Teddy Azar, who was in the, he designed the wigs, uh, Fritz Holt. Fritz was our stage manager and just truly the heart and soul of the show. And we all adored him. Everybody adored Fritz Holt. Everybody. So when he passed, it was, it was the thing that, that really hurt the company. Are you comfortable talking about Fritz? Sure. Can, we, can, we, can you tell me about how the epidemic affected you? Your well, life? 
well, he died of AIDS in 1987. Um, so it certainly impacted me. Um, yeah. What else can I tell you? We had been together almost 16 years. He had had several bouts of uh, opportunistic infections, and so he was in the hospital several times for in the last four months or so, and so I'm sure everybody, you know, by that time, every, every, everybody knew that it was rampant and certainly just tearing through the theater community. You deal with, with things in your personal life the way you deal with them, and, um, you know, hopefully you go in through that stage door and leave all that stuff outside for two and a half hours and, and, and go up on that stage and give these paying customers their money's worth. And then they pulled us together and let us know that he had passed before the show. And going out on stage, and we, man, I'm a little emotional about it now. We really love this man. But the, the opening number is We Are What We Are. And we, we couldn't sing it. And we, we had to, and we are like, we are, this is where our arms are, we are what we are, and we, I mean, hardly any of us could sing. And as we heard everybody else breaking up, and we had just tears running down our face, mascara. Um, we like almost not singing it. So people were people were singing in the wings, trying to trying to give us more sound. But we were we were devastated losing Fritz. Here we were celebrating uh, the right of people to be themselves, uh, for there not to be any fear, and yet fear was so prevalent. There wasn't a guy there, a gay guy in that company who hadn't lost a partner or lost dear friends during that time. It was that. It was a curious juxtaposition of things that were happening in the society as a whole with, with the AIDS epidemic. And here we were uh, in a musical, in a successful musical, a blockbuster hit, uh, celebrating, I guess, the right to be oneself. This was going on. This epidemic was happening right then. So it wasn't just about acceptance of gays. It was acceptance of gays during this awful time when it was thought that AIDS was God's retribution against homosexuality. Uh, so it was a lot to overcome, and for us to be as embraced as we were and celebrated as we were was uh, quite a feat. But I think it helped, too. It helped people to, it was, it was, a, it was a real like, palatable way to see um, a gay relationship. A lot of guys would bring their parents to come see La Caja Fall, and it, they could just sit there and just let them watch it. And it was a way that they, that their audience, that their parents could understand that you could be happy being gay, you could be in love being gay.